Welcome to the talk on free will and tribalism. The, uh, many of the points I need to, um, to get there have been made ably by preceding speakers. The subtitle of the talk is You Control Your Own Mind, because that is the issue. That is the issue of free will. That is the issue of tribalism and collectivism versus individualism. Tribalism, as has been pointed out, is a form of collectivism. Its distinction, its distinction is that it's anti-conceptual collectivism, as Ayn Rand uh, describes in her article, The Missing Link, where she likens the anti-conceptual, non-thinking people to the missing link between the ape and, and man. Real man is a thinking being. Uh, but uh, the people who don't want to think, who don't want to form concepts, who don't want to use their rational faculty are what she calls the anti-conceptual faculty because they become opposed to, um, sir, they become opposed to the use of concepts. It's really a perceptual level mentality because the two forms of cognition are seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, perception, and thinking, the use of concepts, abstract ideas. So if you're anti-conceptual, you stick close to the perceptual level. You can think of it as hardcore collectivism because all collectivism tends towards tribalism. There are more polite forms of collectivism that exist in a more civilized society, but they degenerate pretty quickly into real collectivism, which is tribalism. And one of the advantages of the term tribalism is it gets across the low level uh, that collectivism occupies. Collectivism is not a sophisticated, fancy doctrine. It is barbaric. It is primitive. It is what tribes uh, of uneducated, pre-civilized savages have. It's the primordial default psychology, philosophy, ideology, I guess it doesn't rise to ideology. So on the abstract level, whether it's tribalism or some more polite form of collectivism, it's opposed to individualism. I just wanted to summarize. Tara Smith did this well. I have a slightly different slant. Collectivism holds the, co the collective, the group, the race, the nation, the state, the society, the class, the gender, and there are a million names for it. The collective is the real entity. The individual exists only as a part or an abstraction from the social organism, from the class, the race. As uh, Tara said, it's as a, right? I'm speaking to you as a white male that I am not a real individual. I am basically an organ in the uh, male gender and the white race. And their view, individualism, the correct view, is that the individual is the real entity. The collective is only a group of individuals. It's only a name for a group of individuals. Now, the interesting thing is what settles this issue? What is really at stake when one side says, this is real, and the other side says, no, that is real? Where does the rubber meet the road in the opposition of individualism versus collectivism? Collectivism holds what's called the organic view of the state, which is a fancy name for determinism. You are, they say, a social product. I speak as a white male because my ideas, my actions, my attitudes, 
were created by my relations to other white males, not by my relations to black females or white females or any other group. So they often put it, the, cell, uh, the individual is to society as a cell is to the body of an organism. Now, if you take a cell in my finger, it's controlled by the whole. The cell will be destroyed if the needs of the whole require it. If I start to starve, the body will digest various less necessary cells to keep the more necessary cells going. The original creation of the cell in my finger was by differentiation from the same DNA or the expression of genes on the same DNA that's in every other cell. So if you look at what makes a cell a part of the body, and the body really be an organic whole, and, uh, an organism, it's the causal control of the parts by the needs of the whole. It really is a chemical control that is exerted over the individual, i.e. the cell, and the needs of the uh, whole uh, to, be, to survive and reproduce. So collectivism comes from determinism. It comes from the idea that you are what you are because of the way you were raised and because of what you inherited in your genes. Whether it's nature or nurture, the idea today is that you are a product of determining forces beyond your control. Right? That's what makes the difference between individualism and collectivism in the final analysis. So the issue is, do you have a mind? Are you free? of the control of other people? Do you create yourself, or are you formed by society, that is, by your relationships to others? And by a mind, I mean a thinking faculty. Can you think freely, or must you conform? Now, collectivists don't want to hear this, right? They don't want to have it concretized to the extent that I am now getting to. It comes down to when your parents told you, you have to go to church, there is a God. You have to share your toys. It's selfish to keep them just for yourself. Or don't play with little Kevin, he's Irish and we're Italian. Whatever it is, you know, why can't you marry a nice Indian girl, if Ankar's uh, parents? Whatever it is they tell you, can you disagree? And disagree not as an emotional reaction, but can you say to yourself, does that make sense? Why, why do you think there's a God? Why shouldn't I be selfish? Why shouldn't I play with Kevin? Why shouldn't I marry whoever I love? Can you ask that question in your mind? Yes, you can. I did. I'm sure most of you did, right? You can think. You can raise questions. Thinking is asking and answering questions for yourself. Now, that's what it comes down to. <clears throat> if men accept the notion, says Ayn Rand, that the individual is helpless intellectually and morally, that he has no mind and no rights, because having rights follows from having a mind, as we'll see, that he is nothing but the group is all and his only moral significance lies in selfless service to the group, they will be pulled obediently to join a group. But which group? Now we get to tribalism as a form of collectivism. The preceding slide was about collectivism, per se. Which group? 
Well, if you believe that you have no mind and no moral value, you cannot have the confidence to make choices. So the only thing for you to do is to join an unchosen group, the group into which you were born. That's tribalism. So I want to explain Ayn Rand's theory of free will because that is what refutes every bad idea that we've been talking about. That's what establishes individualism, individual free will. Your autonomy, your rights, your sovereignty over yourself comes down to you have a choice. You control your own mind. Ayn Rand is the first philosopher to offer a theory of free will that's mental. Free will is not primarily about whether I move my arm to the right or move to the left, whether I vote Democratic, Republican, or something else, or don't vote. Free will is primarily something I do inside me. It's the choice to think or not to think. Now, this is a radically new theory of free will, and all the objections that you've heard to free will, that is, explanations or, uh, expositions of determinism, depend upon not raising or being aware of this idea of free will, which is clearly more fundamental than the choice of actions or the choice of ideas you don't really choose your ideas. You choose a certain method of asking and answering questions, or not asking and not answering questions. But whatever the contents of your mind are that you assent to internally, that's what it is to accept and believe an idea. And if you then act on it, it really becomes ingrained. But it's mental. And you don't, it's not like you could see two and two is four. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. Okay, now what am I going to believe about two and two is four? I, I see that it is, but should I believe it? There's no such thing as seeing that it is and not believing it. Yes, it's four, but I don't believe it. That's a contradiction. So there is no direct choice of ideas. The choice is to go through a certain mental process called thinking or not to. For short, to be rational or irrational, because it's deeper than just formulating a question in your mind. It's the whole orientation towards reality and your life. Are you rational? Do you use your conceptual faculty or not? So this is her statement of the nature of free will, the beginning of it. Thinking is not an automatic function. Now, what does she mean by an automatic function? Well, you swallow food, and your stomach starts to do certain things, gets into your intestines, and they do certain things. That's automatic. You don't choose that. That is wired into you. Thinking is not wired into you. Right, right now, you don't have to pay attention. You can let your mind go and think about what you're going to do tomorrow or the person sitting next to you. You don't have to pay attention and ask questions of what I'm saying, like, is that right? Do I know anything that contradicts that? Can I fit that into wider ideas I have already validated? Or just, what would be an example of that? Was the example I gave of an automatic function, did that make sense? So you can do that, but you don't have to do that. It's not like the food in your stomach is going to be digested. The acid is going to pour out of it. The stomach is going to make motions. You don't control that, but whether you think or not, you do control. In any hour and issue of his life, man is free to think or to evade that effort. Thinking requires a state of full, focused awareness. The act of focusing one's consciousness is volitional, is free will. Now, what is the 
what if you don't? What happens if you don't make the choice to think? Words still go through your mind. It's not quiet in there. Only you're not managing them. You're not directing them. You're not purposefully engaged in a quest to find out something. You're chattering to yourself. It's like the radio is on inside. But that still has an effect on your psychology. You're going to go along with the ideas of others because you're not subject, you hear them and you're not subjecting them to critical thought. The character in the fountainhead is Peter Keating that represents the psychology of the person who becomes dependent on others because he doesn't think for himself. I happened to walk into a restaurant that's right out there. And this was on a mural on the wall. Unfortunately, the lighting makes it hard to read. I tried to Photoshop it a little, but if you read across the top, it's a huge like $5 bill stylized. See on the top, there is on the left, only we. There is only we. That's because me has given up. When you see somebody exalting the we, what they're saying is, I'm scared. Why are they scared? Well, Yaron said it in his comments briefly. I want to just kind of like really say it. Non-thinking leads to ignorance. If you don't think about, well, should I go to church? Is there a God? You don't know. If you don't think about, is it right to be selfish or wrong to be selfish? You don't know. If you don't think about, is school good or is it bad? You have your emotions, but you don't know, and you know you don't know. You can have opinions, and you know you have opinions, but you also know you can't prove them. Ignorance leads to fear. Ignorance leads to fear because you need to know. Imagine that you were, had to walk blindfolded. You know, I'm on the stage now. If I had to walk with my eyes shut, I'd feel frightened. I don't know what's out there, what's going to hit me. If you have conceptual blindfolds on, if you have your conceptual eyes shut, if you don't think even though you have a lot of opinions, you don't know what's going to hit you, and you learn that real quick because things hit you all the time. Think of what the view of life is of these people who uh, hold this philosophy. I'd like to take Woody Allen. Woody Allen really believes all the stuff that we're fighting against <laughs> with objectivism. In a kind of cute way, he really believes all that stuff. And if you look at his movies, what does he say? I wouldn't join any club that would have me as a member. Remember that line? I think it's Annie Hall, I'm not sure. Uh, life is suffering and pain and mistake, and I've been through all these divorces, I married the wrong women. Uh, I can't, I'm a schlub, I can't get anywhere. Life is dark, and you know, there are more eloquent, serious ways of saying this, but the people who hold this irrationalist philosophy know they don't know. They get hit in the face by bad things that they didn't foresee because they didn't use their mind, and they feel life is sickness unto death as the um, Kierkegaardian phrase is. Fear and trembling, sickness unto death. They're afraid, but they look around. Well, let me read Ayn Rand's quote. Tribalism is a product of fear, and fear is the dominant emotion of any person, culture, or society that rejects man's power of survival, reason. Now, this is one of the things in the early, early exposure I had to objectivism. I heard this idea, reason is man's tool of survival, basic tool of survival. And I thought, yeah, everybody knows that. 
I mean, that's, that's almost a bromide of, of the intellectual world. And then I noticed progressively, no, no one says that. It's kind of implicit in the best ideas that there were before in the old culture that's gone now. But it was never articulated, and now it's not even implicit. Now it's denied. Uh, Eric Fromm, a psychologist who was popular in the 60s, said, love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. And that's not far from what everybody believes. So getting back to this, non-thinking means you're afraid. That is, wrong free will choice makes you live in fear and trembling. But you look around, there are other people who seem confident. Donald Trump, I seem really confident. I mean, confident to the point of swagger and braggadocio. We're going to win, folks. And let me tell you again, we're going to win. <laughs> you can count on it. They look confident. And this goes for when you're six, the other guy in the, in the schoolyard who says, give me your lunch money, they look confident. They're not thinking, oh, give me your lunch money. They, you know, they look confident. So they seem to know. You don't know they're faking confidence. You can't introspect their fear. Donald Trump is deeply afraid. He has to be because he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He's at the head of the most powerful country in the world. He can't tell truth from falsehood, and he doesn't know what to do. So he has all these advisors, which he keeps you know, firing and hiring new ones of. He doesn't know what to do. You've got to be afraid in that situation. But he looks confident. People don't fake unconfidence. Everyone wants to look confident. No one wants to, you know, appear to be more doubtful and afraid than he is. Everyone wants to be more confident and less afraid than he is. So the child doesn't know that other people are just as frightened as he is. Most, all of them, not all of them, but many of them are most as frightened as he is. They look like they know what they're doing, so he conforms. Follow them. They seem to know. Follow them. That's the psychology in a nutshell of the second hander. And it results in the view that people are reality. So we get to something fancily called the organic view of the state. The individual is to society as a cell, as a body. And what it comes down to is I'm scared and don't know what to do, but they look like they're knowing, so I'll follow them. That's what it all comes down to. And that is due to their not choosing to think. Philosophically, it's called the social primacy of consciousness, the view that people are reality. Their minds create reality. So if I follow their minds, I don't have to worry about reality. They know they create reality. Why, well, you can ask me the question, Peter, why doesn't he take the view that they are thinking and that's how they know reality? He doesn't take that view. Okay. Instead of being second-handed, anybody can be first-handed. He need only choose to activate his mind, his rational faculty. And what that means is to focus your mind and then to steer it, to keep it in focus on your goal. I want to know this. I want to know, is this true? Is selfishness good or bad? I want to know. I want to find out. So you ask a question, well, what is selfishness? And then you ask a question of your answer. And eventually, if you're a genius like Ayn Rand, you can get to the alternative of your life versus your death. Most people can't get there, but they can easily get to, there's nothing behind this claim we have to live for others. And do they have to live for me? If it's more blessed to give than to receive, 
then for me to be more blessed, you have to receive and become less blessed. We're all at each other's throats. That can't be right. But basically, there's no reason for altruism, for unselfishness. So you have a choice. You don't have to relinquish control over your own mind. You don't have to go along with mommy. You don't have to follow those others. No one has to accept what he's taught. You know how they put it today? Well, the parents and teachers inculcate values into the child. There's no such process as inculcation. They're saying things to them, and then if they don't think about it and they hear it enough, it becomes internalized. It seeps in because they're not thinking, they're not questioning. <clears throat> No special strength is required to be independent. No special strength. This is, this is the hardest thing for people to see. People say, well, I don't really have the strength to, to fight off the ideas of parents. And so I, I see that I have given in, but I just wasn't strong enough. There's no strength required. All you have to do is ask certain questions. Your parents don't even know if you're asking those questions in your mind. They can't hear what you're thinking. And the view that there is a special strength required to be independent comes from the extent to which one has already become dependent. To the extent that someone has become a conformist, one gives special power to other people and it feels like they've got their fingers in your brain and you have to pull them out. And unfortunately, that's what you have to do. But if you started thinking all along, the fact that somebody comes up to you and says, you're a capitalist? What are you doing? Gang, gang, this guy's a capitalist. <laughs> yeah. Remember that diagram of uh, all the pictures, all the fingers pointing at, you know, guilt, 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 shame, 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 the fingers are pointing? Uh, you know, the girl in the center is going like this, but she, you know, she could be going like this. That those fingers have no, until they get a gun, those fingers have no power over you. And when they get a gun, they have no power over your mind, they just stop it. So I want to end with um, the quote that brought me into objectivism. In 1962, Ayn Rand spoke at MIT, and I, went, I didn't know anything about it, but she's controversial. I've heard her described as a radical individual. It sounds good to me. I'll go listen, and whoo, I was a freshman who went way over my head. I, didn't, I couldn't follow the accent. But I happen to hear this, man can focus his mind to a full, active, purposefully directed awareness of reality, or he can unfocus it and let himself drift into semi-conscious days. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I'm in a semi-conscious days right now. Merely reacting to any chance stimulus of the immediate moment. That doesn't sound good, yeah. Uh, and I leaned forward in my seat and I tried to be in full focus, not knowing, you know, really what that was for the rest of the lecture. And I didn't understand a tenth of it, but I knew that that was the most important thing I'd ever heard in my life. No one had ever said it before. It was obviously true. And this woman was on to something. So um, I want to end with that statement, which should give you the introspective awareness of the fact that you control your own mind. That's why individualism is true. That's what collectivism wants you to evade. So let's take questions now. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks Hi. for your talk. There is this idea promoted both across the political spectrum but by social psychologists about cognitive biases. 
cognitive biases. Yeah. Would you comment on it? Yes. Um, there is a legitimate phenomenon and an illegitimate phenomenon in cognitive bi in the discussion of c cognitive bias. Uh, there is the legitimate part. There is a tendency to um, take one's own case as the uh, model of everything else and to ignore factors that can present you with a biased sample uh, of reality and you overgeneralize from a biased sample. Um, the uh, best, a good illustration of that is the um, election, not this last election, that might be a biased sample, but they, uh, in the early days of polling in the election of Truman versus, um, who was that guy that he defeated? Dewey. Dewey. The polls were so much in favor of Dewey that the papers already printed the headline, Dewey wins, and of course Truman won. The reason was that they conducted the poll by telephone in 1948, and a lot of people didn't have telephones in 1948 enough so that and th those people were more for Truman, enough so that Truman actually won among voters. He just would have lost if it had been restricted to the more wealthy voters, the more uh, middle class and upper class voters. So that's an example of a bias. The pollsters never thought of that because everybody they knew had a telephone. In 1948, it's not like the telephone was a new thing. It was invented in the 19th century. And a lot of people had it. But there were a considerable number of you know, rural people and uh, poor people in cities that the pollsters didn't consider because they weren't part of their world. I remember in the Kennedy election in 1960, uh, everybody I knew was for Nixon. And I thought Nixon was going to win, but that was just the people I knew. And my state went for Nixon, but Nixon lost. So it's easy to think that, that the, your, the things you're familiar with are represent the whole population when they're not. The illegitimate part is the determinist suggestion that you can't avoid it, that it's built in, that you have to be biased, which is a self-contradiction. And this is a powerful weapon against all forms of determinism and hence against all forms of collectivism. There's a contradiction in the idea that you are a social product. There's a contradiction in the idea that we're all cognitively biased and we can't help it. The contradiction is if that were true, you couldn't know it. If we're all cognitively biased, and the scientists who come up with the idea of cognitively bias are cognitively biased, and that, that is a bias, not a fact. If collectivism is true and you are a social product, then that's just what you have to believe, that you are a social product, and you are not a social product, or not necessarily. You don't know. So if something runs your mind, you can't know anything because you're fed ideas, whether they're true or false. You can't decide whether they're true, because if you say, well, they're true because A, B, and C, but that's just a thought fed to you by your genes or by your culture or by your gender or whatever, and that has no more legitimacy than the original idea you were thinking about. So uh, a mind that's run by something that can't take an independent look at the facts is disqualified from knowing anything, including that it's in that state. <coughs> Knowledge requires self-control, independent free judgment, not being cognitively biased. So yes, there are cognitive biases, but the basic fact is we have free will that can defeat any bias. The idea that we don't is self-contradictory. Next question. Um, hi, Dr. Vinswego. You said in your talk for the second handle that it's people equals reality in social primacy of consciousness. People and, what? Uh, people equal reality yeah. and in social primacy of consciousness. And then you said, 
but they don't accept their views, the people. And I was, and you said ask about that in the yeah. Q&A. So. Why, why don't they, instead of saying people equal reality, why don't they say uh, other people know by their thinking what I don't know because I haven't been thinking? I mean, that, you know, logically, you could, you could look back and say, you know, I never thought about any of this stuff. They seem real confident. They must have thought it through. Why don't people have that view? And then they would ask, well, what's your reasons for thinking that selfishness is bad? What's your reason for thinking equality is good? Why don't they do that? Why did they equate people with the reality? Because they're not self-conscious. Part of free will is being self-conscious. If you didn't think, I mean, you know there are times when you decide, I'm not going to study for that exam. If I fail it, I fail it. But I'm just, I, I just can't stand this stuff. I'm not going to do it. If you do that, and you go in the exam, and you fail it, you come out, well, I guess that didn't work. But, you know, I said I'd accept it, and I guess I have to. That's not what happens in life. You know, it's not that people are self-aware and decide not to think, and no, they didn't. They don't know what went on. Here I am, I, I find myself thinking so-and-so, like selfishness is bad, yeah. Where did you get that idea? Well, I mean, everybody knows it. They don't say, well, my mother repeatedly told me, Harry, you weren't put on this earth just to serve yourself. See, I know it because I thought about it and rejected it. But they don't know where they got their ideas. They don't know how the content of their consciousness got in there. So it just seems like it's perceptually obvious. Selfishness, I mean, who doesn't know that? Everybody knows that there's a God. Everybody knows that the world is flat. Whatever they hold. Okay, so they don't have the view that the other people that anybody gets to an idea by a process. So they think that there's just content of reality in there. They don't understand that there's an external world. You go through certain mental processes and you come out with a conclusion. Even when that goes on, they're not aware of it. So they think that the mind is just equivalent to fact. What's in the mind, in other people's minds, since they're confident, that must be fact. So people people's minds equal, there's no independent reality. I used to teach college, you know, and I would make the point, society can be wrong. Wait, society? Society, well, how can, for instance, when Columbus sailed out, people thought the world was flat, but it wasn't, they were wrong. Columbus knew all along the world was round. But wasn't it round for them? <laughs> Always get that. It's like a third of the class. But what, it was round for them. I mean, sorry, flat. It was flat for them, the people who thought it was. It was flat for them. They, and it chills me because they don't have the idea of an independent, objective reality. Peter Schwartz just wrote an article in the Huffington Post, was it? or real clear politics on the lack of the idea of objective reality. That's why objectivism starts with existence exists, because we make a distinction between consciousness and people's minds. They don't because they are not aware of how things got into their mind. Thank you for your, thank you for your talk. Last question. Um, so I'm, uh, the, the objectivist view of free will is intuitive to me. I, I can introspect and I can see that that's what's going on, that I'm making choices. And, and I understand that people, everybody is capable, right. does do the- Wrap it up, I apologize. you're after me. But obviously people, most people um, accept the views of their culture. So why is it that there are so few people that reject, that don't reject the moral presuppositions of their culture? That's a, a good question, which I don't have any. Why are so many people second-handers is really the question. Beats me. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say I was Howard Rourke, but I did question the morality and the religion and the politics and everything else. Uh, there were things I didn't question. 
But basically, I don't know why they don't do it. So I wish if you find out, you let me know. Keith wants to close this? Yeah, so no, just let's thank Dr. Benzwanger one more time.